So we are going to move to our second panel, the big questions every business leader needs to ask about doing business in the Middle East. And we have a wonderful um, expert panel, which will be moderated by Bill Flanagan, who is the chief, chief corporate relations officer for the Allegheny Conference on Community Development, which represents 300 major corporations here in the region. And Bill has been a great friend of the Institute. He moderates our panels uh, every business conference we have. This is our eighth annual conference, and we've also had other events, and he's been right there, Johnny on the spot, to help us. Last night he gave a, um, we, had a we had a little welcome dinner for some of our uh, visiting dignitaries and, and our sponsoring companies, and he gave a tremendous history about Pittsburgh and its storied industrial past, how it, oil was first discovered outside of Pittsburgh in uh, 1859, and so many strides that have happened and also how Pittsburgh reinvented itself after the collapse of its steel industry. It had been very heavily reliant on, on this one major industry and how it reinvented itself. So without further ado, Bill, if you would like to bring your panel up, uh, please come to the stage. Thank you. Hi, it's great to be here with everybody today. We'll let our panelists go on up and uh, find a seat, and we will plunge in. Uh, I love doing uh, this type of panel because this is about big questions, which means my guests come with both questions and answers, which means I have nothing to do except watch the clock. <laughs> but it's great to be here with all of you. Um, we are, we're fortunate with us today to have panelists with a lot of experience uh, in the Middle East and doing business there, <coughs> and hence uh, with a lot to share, uh, uh, other to, for, to share with other uh, other businesses about some of the opportunities there, some of the things to ask about maybe before you plunge in. So uh, let me just to, uh, briefly introduce each of them. Um, I'll start on the far left there, from the perspective of the audience. Uh, Steve Lutz is uh, director of Middle East and North Africa Affairs for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and uh, he's also responsible for managing the U.S. Egypt Business Council, the U.S. Iraq Business Institute, and the U.S. GCC Business Institute. Serves as executive director for each of those in, the, in that capacity as well. So he's a busy guy, and it's great to have you here in Pittsburgh. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sitting next to him is uh, Mike Lordi, Vice President of Global Services for Elliott Group, which is uh, located in Jeanette. That's about 30 miles or so east of Pittsburgh, I guess, right? And uh, Mike uh, directs the uh, worldwide service operations of Elliott Group, which is a leading supplier of highly engineered rotating equipment to the oil and gas, petrochemical, and general industrial markets. Uh, and uh, Elliott's global service network includes repair facilities, field service, engineering offices, and parts distribution centers in 40 countries. Great to have you. Welcome. Thanks. Great to be here. Right here next to me is, uh, is Devesh Sharma, Managing Director of Aquatech International. He's also the Chief Commercial Officer of the company, which was established in 1981. Aquatech, a global leader in water purification technology for industrial and infrastructure markets. It's a focus on water scarcity solutions such as thermal desalination, membrane desalination, water reuse, and zero liquid discharge. Devesh, good to have you. Welcome. Good to see you, Bill. All right, well, why don't we just plunge in? And you know what, uh, Steve, I think I'll start with you, uh, sure. since you've got your eye on the whole, the whole Middle East and obviously represent the interests of lots of different businesses. What should be on their minds if they've not done a lot of business over there? What's the big question you would encourage every one of them to ask? Absolutely. Well, first, if I can, I want to thank uh, Simon and, and just say that the Chamber, we're very proud to be a, a partner of the event and, and very grateful to be here today. Um, when we, that's a great question and a great, uh, hopefully, table setter. Um, when we look at the region, one of the most important things that it's more of a statement than it is a question that we encourage people to think about is to read beyond the headlines. Um, you pick up the newspaper nowadays and you read about the Middle East and, and you read about turmoil and strife and, and violence. Um, but the region's very dynamic. Um, each country is very different with unique opportunities and challenges. Uh, so we would ask people to, you know, explore beyond the headlines and challenge people to do that uh, because there are vast opportunities uh, throughout the entire region. 
Um, the one thing that I think is a very important question for everybody to consider when you get beyond the, the ABCs of, you know, is there a market there for my good or service, is to consider the, the regulatory environment for each country, each market. Um, it's something that we at the Chamber are, are very focused on and we're working uh, with our friends uh, in the U.S. government and the foreign governments and the private sector uh, to encourage uh, the sort of regulatory framework that encourages investment, trade, uh, between the United States and each individual country. But we encourage companies to understand not only the current state of regulations that impact their business, uh, but to examine beyond that. Uh, what is on the plate? You know, for example, in Egypt, you know, to use the example, they're looking at a, a VAT tax. Um, what would that mean for your company if you were gonna start doing business there, if you were gonna have an office there, all those sorts of things. And there's questions like that across every country. So it's really to understand uh, the dynamics of how your industry is being regulated and what that might mean for you going forward before you make an investment or consider doing business there. So sadly, there is no one big question that cuts across the entire Middle East. I thought there was at least one big question for every single country. Yeah, it, it, that's a very good uh, summary, yes. It's, it's very important, I think, to get beyond looking at it as, as just a region. Uh, just think of the United States as, as 50 different states. You can't just paint a broad brush of the United States and, and understand the United States and doing business here um, by looking at it as one big market. You have to, and you can even delve deeper. Um, and I would challenge people to do that, even, even within countries. Um, there's certain locales and uh, how they do business. If you I take Iraq, for example, um, I, I've been there a lot, do a lot of uh, work there. And you've got to get beyond, you know, just the region, so the, the areas that are controlled by Daesh, and, and you've got to look at Basra, you've got to look at the Kurdistan region. Uh, there's incredible opportunities there. And if you talk to uh, business people there or uh, government officials there, they want U.S. companies. Uh, U.S. companies, it's the gold standard. Our products and our services are sought after uh, so that you're pushing on an open door, uh, and you will only find people that are looking to do business with you. Um, so I think it's, it's a very important question slash uh, and point, uh, point to make is it's not just a region, it's, uh, it's individual countries and even individual communities and in, in how they do business. I would think though, for your middle market and smaller members, that could be almost paralyzing. So many different countries, so many different things to think about, far easier maybe not to deal with it at all. How do you get them over that hurdle? Well, I think you have to go, there's a lot of different resources out there. Uh, there's there's uh, events that are being convened like this um, you know, talk to Simon, you can talk to folks at the U.S. Chamber. Uh, the, American, the U.S. Chamber has American Chambers of Commerce in over 100 countries. So we have an affiliate, uh, three in Saudi Arabia, for example, one in Riyadh, one in Jeddah, one in the Eastern Province. Uh, we have folks in Baghdad, we have folks in the Kurdistan region. Um, they're there, they're on the ground, they really know how things work. So you can draw on AmCham's. Uh, also, be sure to, to tap into the, the U.S consulates in the U.S. embassies. Uh, most of them have commercial attaches uh, embedded within the embassies. And of course, in Washington, D.C. And, and throughout the country, uh, the foreign governments have embassies and consulates, and they have economic specialists and staff. Again, you're, you're pushing on an open door, so it's just a phone call or email away. But that is one last point before we move on to some others. Uh, I think it's very important that beyond the emails and the phone calls, you have to go there. Um, once you've done your research, you've explored, and you determine, okay, this is a, a this is a potentially a good market for me. You've got to buy that plane ticket, and you're going to need to know that you're going to need to go back many times. Um, it's it's very important to develop relationships, uh, have uh, sit down for a lot of a lot of tea, and uh, but make yourself um, go there. So it's an important question: is do I have the resources and the time to invest to actually do that? because I think that's going to make your business much more successful is if you do invest the time and the money that it takes to go there and meet people and develop relationships. That's very critical. Devesh, let me go to Unix and, and Aquatech, obviously the younger of the two companies represented here. You've only been around for about 34 years compared to Elliot, it's about a century or so, I think. Uh, so yeah, from your perspective, you know, getting a toehold, obviously a company that has had to expand into the Middle East as, well, as part of its growth strategy, you know, what's on your mind? What should be the question or the, the key lesson to be thinking about as a company begins to move into those markets, especially a smaller and mid-sized company? Well, I think um, the, the best way to answer that is to kind of share some of our experiences when, when we were going in. Um, we've done business for probably over 20 years in the Middle East, uh, but for 
the most most of the early years, it was I don't consider that we were doing business in the Middle East. We were shipping equipment to the Middle East, mm. so we were working for maybe a U.S. or a Japanese client, like a Bechtel or a Mitsubishi Heavy, and we would be supplying them equipment. So technically, we were doing business in the Middle East, but not really. Mm. When we really started trying to get in locally, um, I think uh, you know some of the experience that I could share, if I were to sum it up, building a bit on, on, on what you had to say was um, when, you, when you get past the filters or the background noise or the headlines, it's really uh, a relatively easy place to do business. Um, for example, you don't have any real currency issues. The currencies are generally pegged to the US dollar. The prevalent business language is English. Uh, it's not necessarily the same even when you go to Europe or you go to China or, or, or India. So uh, you have a great recognition of US technology and US quality and, and US companies are wanted there. So you're, you're welcome there and you have a relatively little local competition that could be very competitive or low cost. So it's really a very, very um, relatively easy place compared to some of the other places we've done business in the world. Uh, but you have to get past those headlines. I think it's very important. A lot of people, um, you, you know, when we went in, we'd think, oh, we need um, a local partner that's very well connected. No, we, we actually have set up, without a JV, we've set up as a local uh, entity, wholly owned subsidiary there, and we, we find it very easy to do business in the Middle East. Um, another point to build on is you have to get a little more granular. You can't generalize. It's not the Middle East. Saudi is Saudi. Qatar is Qatar, Egypt is Egypt, Kuwait is Kuwait. Uh, it even goes a little more. You can't say the UAE is UAE, Abu Dhabi is Abu Dhabi, Dubai is Dubai, and Sharjah is Sharjah. So uh, you really have to understand uh, the, the, the local uh, aspects and what are the, the local drivers. And I, I think right now the biggest thing is looking to the future is um, one of the biggest trends that we see is it's a very young population, and the, the biggest thing on the minds of most of the governments there, particularly I would say Oman and Saudi Arabia, is they want to build the local workforce, localization of the workforce. And this is something that companies that want to be local and, and in uh, the region have to recognize. Is it a threat? Is it an opportunity? That's, that's up for the companies that are participating to decide. Uh, Steve really talked about the importance of being on the ground, though, being in these countries. Really. So you may not need the J, the joint venture, but you do need to be there, you think? To, oh, you, you absolutely need to be there. Um, it's, it's, it's a, um, the way of doing business in the re Middle East is highly relationship de dependent, and it's highly, relationships are developed over time. So you have to exhibit a long-term commitment on the ground. You need a strong local team. You need management to to also periodically visit, and we're not talking about once every couple of years, they need to keep seeing you because then they develop a, a comfort and, and they see your long-term commitment. And uh, you know, it's not transactional based. Sometimes people won't buy from you just because you're cheapest. They want, to, they want partners and, and it's important. And you know, to, to the point about the JVs, um, the formula that has been successful for us is we have a few local establishments, particularly in the UAE, Oman, and Saudi Arabia. But we also have some alliance partners in each country that, that help us on the ground. Uh, and, and I think some combination of the two. Uh, when we went in, we thought, oh, you know, we'll just find one partner and do a JV for the Middle East. And I'm very glad we didn't do that. And that's, that's probably one of the biggest uh, things um, that, that companies going in have to understand is that you need to look at each country on a granular basis. That's interesting. So you really thought, I, I want a strategy in each country. There's no sort of one size fits all. There's no turnkey. I can't find a partner that can manage this for me and make it happen. In, in 2003 or four, we thought we'd parachute into Dubai, open an office in a free zone, and hey, we're in the Middle East, and we couldn't be more wrong. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, does this resonate from your experiences at, at Elliott? Yeah, I, th I think it depends where you are on your maturity curve in countries. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been in a country, in a region for a very long time, going back to the late 50s, early 60s, when we first sold equipment into the you know petrochemical facilities there. 
Um, today, we have offices in, I think, four countries in the Middle East. We're, some are wholly owned, some are with JP Partners. It depends, I think, on, on your installed population of equipment, what your customer base wants, because in each country it's a little bit different. Um, in, in the Kingdom, for example, we have a joint venture building a new facility there. We, we just broke ground about a week ago. So in that case, we, we needed a partner because that's what, that's what the, uh, the government encouraged. And so we, we follow their lead. And as a new company coming in the region, I think you have to look at, are you a niche company that you have a very specific product that you're entering with or are you coming in with a broad brush of uh, products in your portfolio? And I think that, that helps you decide your entry strategy. Because your entry strategy is quite different from your long-term strategy. I mean, you have to get in, get your toe wet, um, get the customers aware you're there and, and start transacting, and then you can decide what type of an entity I want, how many employees do I really need for this, this type of uh, location, and, and you build from there. But I agree with you 100%, it's a relationship business. And, and it doesn't matter what your product is, if it costs a dollar or $10 million, that relationship is everything. And if you don't have that, take a pause and say, okay, it's gonna take me several years to get this relationship built, but I need to do it. And well, that's a good point. That's one of the big questions that we've seen. Am I prepared to invest in building sure. these relationships or not? If you're not, if you're looking for some quick thing, it may not be appropriate if you're willing to work on it, right, Steve? It, it, oh, 100%, a, a, we just completely concur that relationships are, are absolutely pivotal. Um, something else when you step back, I think it's important to understand um, not only the regulatory environment and what that might look like going forward, but it's to understand what the priorities are, um, again, of those respective countries or those respective locales. You know, if you look at the GCC countries, you see a lot of them looking to diversify their economies. So they're taking the revenue that's been generated from years and years uh, of the oil and gas industry and they're investing that in knowledge-based sectors like healthcare. Um, like ICT, like education. So understanding that and, and understanding what that means going forward and then what special programs that they might be offering you know, to attract investment in those sectors. Um, I know we have friends here from the SAGIA, the Saudi Arabia uh, General Investment Authority, and getting to know them and understanding you know, what is the kingdom's priorities um, beyond energy, you know, what are they doing in these other sectors and what are they doing to attract investment and how can they be a partner? Um, because as the point's been made, I think partnerships and, and going in with a, a long-term commitment is, is very important that you know, we're here for the long haul and, and we want to be a part of you know, your country's future. We want to see uh, you succeed and, and prosper. I think those sorts of uh, commitments are important. So again, understanding what their long-term plans are, particularly in countries that are, are diversifying, I think it's a very interesting dynamic going forward. So Mike, you've got, uh, Elliot uh, has, has a long history yeah, sure. in the Middle East, taking all the way back to the 50s and 60s, uh, pretty early on. Well, what questions are on your mind today as you look at doing business there, as you're looking where to expand, how to shift what I'm doing? What, what, what are you thinking about now? What we're looking at is, is as Steve indicated, how the industries are changing. Um, in the past, you know, the, um, in the Kingdom, for example, the, they were producing oil and that was their product. They wanted to ship oil out of the country, they ship it to Europe, they ship it to the United States for processing and development. Now, the petrochemical complexes in country are very, very sophisticated. They want to ship end product. So they want to move up the food chain and not just ship raw materials, they want to ship end product to the, to the developed country. So that's a huge problem.